Okay, in theory, we're live now on uh, the Ignite Somerset Facebook page. So um, uh, we're a few minutes early, actually. So um, in case people are going to tune in exactly at five o'clock, I'll just give it a couple of minutes. Oh, we're at five o'clock now, so we can start. So this is um, the Creative Network, which is a project that um, is curated by Ignite Somerset. And Ignite Somerset is a project that's managed by Somerset Film and funded by Arts Council England. We do this every month. Uh, we've been doing it every month for quite a few years now. Um, but actually, this uh, month, for obvious reasons that we don't need to go into in the next hour, um, we are going to be doing this remotely uh, using Facebook Live and uh, we'll probably be using the Somerset Film YouTube channel in the future as well. Um, so because of the current situation, we've kind of curated and pulled together a conversation with um, Fiona Campbell, who's a Somerset based artist. And Fiona's going to join us in a moment from her garden. Um, and we're also going to be joined by uh, Laura Hilton, who is part of the Seed Somerset Seed Sedgemore rather project. Um, she'll tell us a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, so for the foreseeable future, we'll be running our um, Ignite Somerset Creative Network from our homes like this. So this is the first time we've uh, operated like this. We do usually live stream actually, um, but normally we, uh, you know, we're in our home at the engine room, um, but now we're in our own homes. Um, so uh, what we'll do is uh, I'll introduce you first of all to Laura. Um, uh, Laura is a member of the team at Somerset Film and is a key person working on the Seed Sedgemore project. Um, so hopefully if I click a little button here we should see Laura. Hello <laughs> Laura. Hello, hi. Uh, so uh, we've got, I can see on the comments and reactions uh, that we've got a few people watching. Um, uh, okay. They're likely to be artists or people uh, interested in the okay. arts. They're likely to be people interested in um, socially engaged arts practice. Uh, so you've got a really great audience here just watching you. Um, and okay. you would probably want to know more about uh, the Seed Project. I know you're going to post the link when you sign off um, yeah. uh, for how people might find out more. But in a nutshell, tell us about the project. So the project is called Seed uh, and it's part of the Creative People and Places, which is a brand new 1.1 uh, million pounds Arts Council investment um, in the creative arts and culture. Um, and this is for people of Sedgeville. Um, the programme uh, is a new addition uh, and of a growing network of creative people and places in England. Um, so uh, we're part of a consortium. Homes in Sedgemore are the lead on uh, the Seed Sedgemore project. We're built up with Bridgewater Senior Citizens, uh, Bridgewater Town Council and Community Council and Somerset Film um, at the Engine Room in Bridgewater. Okay. So there's some really good partners involved in this project. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we need um, you. We need artists um, to work with us in the future. And um, we need to know who you are, where you are, what your expertise are. Um, and in the post that I'll post after this meeting, um, there is an online survey um, that we'd really like you to. Um, to complete so almost like a skills matrix so we can get to know a bit more about you and um initially well, we, I was going to meet face to face um and that would have been a really great way to get to know um the artists um in in around the area as well okay so I know that um uh you had uh scheduled a meeting at the engine room which for obvious reasons isn't going to happen now the purpose of that meeting was to uh, raise the profile of the project, obviously, and mm -hmm. to was the partly the purpose of that project to sort of do a bit of a skills audit and see what skills were in the room. Is this the social arts practice and me, the creative yeah. professional development trait? 
Yeah. yeah, so that was happening um, and it was supposed to happen this Friday. And that was creative professional development training for artists um, or however you identify as an artist mm -hmm. um, who would like to receive some um, professional development in training around working with members of the community in a more socially engaged um, way. And we had Rachel Dobbs who was going to facilitate that session mm -hmm. um, at the end room. And that will still happen. Um, but obviously um, with everything that's happening um, at the in the current climate, that will happen later on at a later date. So we'd still like to offer that to our artists as well okay so obviously there's great opportunities here for community groups to get involved but actually just thinking about the artists watching there's professional development there as well yeah yes there is and and that's we uh, part of the um seed project through creative people in places is a, is it well a big the main part of the project the mission is to work with members of the community um, and do consult work with them in, in terms of consultation and see what they want when we don't know what they want until we've done some of that consultation yeah. and then we will respond to that and we would like to know um, who are the artists in the area and a lot of the time we have amazing creative artists that maybe haven't done much facilitation or maybe they haven't worked in a um, community engaging way um, or maybe in a more socially engaging way as well so that's why we'd like to offer training and support so we can get these really skilled creative talented artists um, hopefully working with on this project and with members of the community and we can come up and produce some amazing um, projects from that and some amazing work as well. So obviously our creative network we're doing like hello there's Fiona hello Fiona <laughs> um, obviously um, this creative network is different to previous creative networks in that, um, you know, we're, we're managing in it in a different way. We're operating from our homes. Um, with the SEED project, is there going to be an opportunity where we can gather online like this? Uh, yes, uh, definitely. I think one of the things that's come, especially working more from home the past few weeks and is doing a lot more online um, meetings in this way is that um, I think this will be a really good way to touch base with artists and different members of the community. Um, it will reduce our, um, definitely reduce our carbon footprint. And I think it's a really good way to stay in touch with people um, who maybe can't make meetings at set times, but can jump on and watch a live stream or be part of a um, Zoom conversation just like we're doing today. Perfect. OK, um, that's really interesting. Thank you, Laura. Um, so when you're going to sign off in a minute and because uh, you've mm -hmm. got lots of important seed stuff to get on with um, and uh, you're going to post a link in the comments for this video um, so those that are watching right now uh, and others can um, can check out more about the project yeah yeah so it, it'd be really great if you come and visit us at seed uh, dot com mm -hmm. and on there there is a list lots of different bits of information hopefully it's really clear and you understand what it is we're doing what our mission is um post your shelfies as well so we have a um okay. instead of selfies we're posting shelfies at the moment so it'd be really great to see um what you have on your shelves at home and um, okay. but also it'd be really great for us in terms of us um contributing to our matrix if you could follow the survey monkey link on there as well and um complete that so we know who you are and what skills you have and so we can touch base with you at a later date as well got it yeah i'm looking at it right now actually very nice so i'll just post that link on your behalf thank you okay thank you so much laura right. thank you thanks Rich. okay thanks see you soon all right then right. now if, bye. Bye. if all goes well we'll now see uh, oh well, scott's just appeared as well i can just see scott scott are you able to say a few words I think Laura's pretty much um, covered the whole story there, Rich, but yeah. uh, maybe one little thing I could add is uh, that um, the Creative People and Places program that SEED has been funded under has been going since about 2013, and there are in fact 30 projects that they've funded across that time. 
What's really exciting about Seed is we are the first one to be successful in the Southwest. Wow. Um, so yeah. it's the first opportunity of its type in, in our region altogether. Uh, so we're really, really keen to engage with as many people as we can uh, and, and really set uh, a really good tone for the Southwest and hopefully there will be future projects funded and supported in the area later on. That's great. That's a really insight. So um, this is the first in the Southwest. Did you say it was the first in a rural uh, county? Um, no, there have been other rural ones. Okay. Um, they, they're, there are quite a lot in London um, okay. and quite a lot in the north. Okay. Um, so yeah, there's a good mixture, of, really, of rural and urban and suburban okay. settings, but, but we are quite literally the first one in, in the whole southwest. Fantastic. That's brilliant. It's great. Okay. I've put the link up, Scott. So, um, Scott, you might just want to introduce yourself. My name's Scott O'Hara. I'm the director of SEED. Uh, I've been in the role now for six weeks. Yeah. As you can probably tell from my voice, I'm originally from Australia, so I, I'm new to the southwest myself. I've been living here about 18 months. Okay, that's fantastic. Thank you, Scott. Um, it's strange. Where where are you at the moment? Where's your where's your virtual background? <laughs> uh, so that's a, that's a view of the Polden Villages, which okay. is obviously a one of the, the key views of Sedgemore. I think Laura was coming to you uh, from an aerial view of Cheddar Gorge as okay. well. Well, I'm coming at you from my shed. Um, what's interesting mm -hmm. is we're, we're seeing this beautiful scene behind you. And what we're hearing, if you listen carefully, is the birds in Fiona's garden because Fiona's broadcasting from her garden. So thank you, um, uh, Scott. That's really good to see you and hear from you and uh, look look forward to finding out more about it. No problem. Thanks for the invitation, Rich. Okay, see you soon. Right. Right. Uh, right then. So, Fiona. Uh, we need Scott to leave the room. <laughs> yeah. uh, hello. Hey. Yeah, you're, we're, we're back on track everything froze for a, a split second um as scott was leaving the meeting so um fiona we've known each other for some time actually haven't we um i'll Ooh. put myself back over here i think <laughs> okay um yeah when i first started on the working on the ignite somerset project which was i think about seven years ago um Fiona, I think you were one of the first artists I met. I don't know if you realise that. But um, we made a film in your garden, I seem to remember. Really? Yeah, and we shot some filming. You've got um, you've got a little studio in the back there and you, you were busy welding all kinds of gear on. That yeah. was you, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> you well, don't remember well, shooting the film? I no, I, I remember a radio interview with you. Um, yeah, we with, shot some film. Yeah, that was that was, and no, I know you you did some filming. I thought that was at the engine room, but God, my memory's terrible. <laughs> okay, so Fiona, you're in your garden. Yeah, I'm in my shed. All of the people uh, the, who are joining us uh, are in their homes, hopefully, and um, uh, we're going to make this as as regular a creative network as uh, as as we normally have, which which is usually uh, a little bit of a presentation from the artist. Um, and we've already had a chat about um, some of your work and you've sent me some images which I'll share with the uh, viewers right now. Um, so we'll do that much as though we were at the engine room and then we'll have a little um, Q&A session. Um, and if anybody's got anything that they want to ask Fiona, probably the best way of doing that is to just add a comment to this, um, to this video post and I'll ask... Fiona. So um, shall, shall we start by looking at some of your work? That'd be good. Okay, so what I'm going to do is make you disappear for a moment and hopefully you can see your work on your screen, Fiona. That's a very old piece. So shall I start? Uh, yeah, I'm going to put myself over here. Down Are you? <laughs> I like it the other way. Um, in, so. in which case, let's go there. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
So I thought I'd take a journey way back to the 80s. Um, I don't think I've even shared this with, um, you know, with anyone really on my, it's not on my website. I don't think I've had it um, on any social media, but this is my um, final show at the Byamshaw School of Art, um, 87, when I was interested in um, metamorphosis. I was interested in line, taking line for a walk. Um, and I was using all sorts of different materials, but they were kind of being transformed. And this was a bit like a sort of um, kind of then they were interacting, basically. And I thought it was interesting because my more recent work has almost gone full circle to somewhere a little bit like that. It's obviously going to be very, it's very different. Um, but I thought I'd put that one in. Next, please. Okay. Some of the, sorry, just to come back on uh, this particular image. Um, uh, yeah, there's, I can really see obvious connections to surrealist painting. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing that's going on there, yeah, that we're probably all familiar with. Uh, okay. Okay, so a bit of a jump. When I left college, I, I, I guess I sort of felt I had to earn some money. So <laughs> I started making quite large pieces out of scrap um mainly scrap metal not always um but this was you can see parts are scrap and parts were sheet steel um welded he was uh, this runner was um over two meters high and um you know i was selling some of my sculptures but it was just a sort of um a phase of of being relatively representational but still interested in line and and steel became something I was working with a lot this was in London so next mm -hmm. okay and then big jump in my life um I mean I'm not going to show you you know there's obviously lots lots more I could have shown you um but this brings us to um 2009 actually so I um I, you know, my, my life changed. I, I had, I had Jack, my son, and I um, went into teaching for a while uh, in, before that. Um, so after all of that, I, um, or even during, um, while my son was still quite young, I started back up with my sculpting again. Um, but I was still making relatively representational pieces, but quite small. And this, my dung beetle and ball, um, it won a prize, uh, the David Shepherd Wildlife prize uh wildlife foundation prize um but it sort of gave me confidence so i left my teaching job um around that time and kind of jumped back into being self-employed as a i suppose i called myself a sculptor in those days okay. next please so um and i was using um mainly uh, copper i was still interested in in this one particularly interested in lime and lots of weaving um it was copper but also um uh, plastic netting is in there um, and it's this is a cocoon that's um kind of based on a on a on a butterfly cocoon um cloudless sulfur was the name of it and you know these sculptures i was showing in in gardens um kind of exhibiting around the southwest um and making yeah cocoons nests that sort of natural organic kind of forms next please and then in 2010 um i decided to create a, a project for glastonbury festival um for the greenfield so i kind of devised this sort of community project where i made the um structure the inner structure of this spider that was created in different segments um took it to glastonbury um and then with the public who were invited just to sort of drop in um we all made this massive spider so we collected all the dirt all the you know refuse the cans and i also brought a load of sort of bottle tops and beads and buttons along so um the spider was decorated during that four four or five days mm. luckily it was a very sunny festival um and then and since then the, the spider has toured all over the place um and this is him in or it in um uh the devon recycle the devon uh recycle sculpture trail in Tamus. so um mm. he yeah he crouched there for a while and he, he went to all sorts of 
other venues, but he is now, um, I've donated him to Carrymore Environmental Centre, so he's, he's there permanently now. Okay, next. Um, and, you know, still carrying on with this garden sculpture theme, I have been making um, pieces that are kind of uh, link, they're all inspired by nature. Um, these are called vertical forms and they are um, made of scrap steel with woven wire and there's a bit, of, bit of copper nitrate on some of the copper that um, it was they were also inspired by growth and the way lichen um, lichen grows on on you know on trees and branches so that they're much closer you'd see lots of tiny little trellises of um, kind of leafy forms. Mm. Next, please. Um, and back to the um, kind of the community work. So I um, was I went to the Llama Tree Festival with this uh, another structure, this sort of um, steel chameleon structure, and um, adults were invited to drop in and add um bottle tops and so we we, com we completely covered it this uh, a friend of mine elaine um was there helping me um and we they covered it and then it was it was put out as a site sculpture and then next please next and <laughs> that that's it in um Stourhead, um for the uh, a sculpture trial i did with a group that i was a part of called the scratchers um and we created a, a sculpture trail around the, the lakes um, the, sort of beyond the garden, beyond the sort of, you know, the cultivated gardens. And yeah, he crouched there on this massive great big log, um, but he has since again been um, exhibited in different places and he is going to be featured in a, a thing I'm doing with um, Art UK called Masterpieces in Schools. So I'm going to be working with a school where they're going to make something. They're going to have this sculpture at their school for a day, and they're going to make something um, inspired by it. But you can see all this is inspired by by nature um, using scrap materials, which is something that I'm doing more and more now. So recycled, um, found, and you know discarded materials, often often metal, but not always. Next, please. Um, and oh, this was also part of the Scraptor sculpt, Sculpture Trail. So this heron um, we installed in the, a very steep, silty lake. So that was it was quite an adventure actually installing it. Um, and it's all made of different um, steel components that I found. I, I have a bit of a scrapyard in my garden, so I kind of collect all the time. Um, so some of these pieces I get from scrapyards and some I find, find on walks. Um, and it's all welded, and you can maybe see on the face the pair of scissors on for its um, eye and beak. Mm -hmm. And that was, yeah, so that was, um, that was eventually sold. Okay. Next, please. Um, going still in the sort of figurative um, kind of mode, um, I was... Um, a an artist in residence for the for green it was i was called a green capital artist in residence um for bristol's green week in um i think it was 2012 um and i made this he was called um um man um oh i've forgotten that name of the name now um <laughs> it's a very long name anyway it's about um man kind of um as it is comes from the earth but earth is also related to heaven mm -hmm. um and he is steel copper um and he's reaching for the kind of he's sort of a growing creature he's not just a man he's almost um part of of the earth so there's he's a sort of he's not a green man but he's that kind of thing and there's this sense of line going through him and a sense of energy Mm -hmm. Next, please. Um, that was the same project. I also um, created these diatoms, which are um, di the diatoms are tiny microscopic sea creatures. Well, usually sea creatures that um, have the most amazing structure, and they've, they've got a sort of silica shell. So um, you know, they've almost got they have they have actually got a kind of glass um, 
structure to them. And they look like a segment of a lemon or an orange, if you, you know, if you kind of can imagine those segments and the patterns in them. So um, these were floated on the Arnolfini Harbour um, for, the, for the duration of the Green Week Festival. Um, and then I later installed them in um, Somerset Earth Science Centre for uh, my um, next project. I hope I think that's next that one. Go to that one. Oh no, that's not okay. So this is uh, lichen, which um, actually I I'd say was one of my big shifts in my practice. Um, it, it prompted a bit of a change in my work, um, although it's still related. To, I mean, my work does relate to nature, um, but it became slightly more abstracted. This um, this was called the Abundance Garden Trail, and I was commissioned by Sunset Artworks, along with um, seven other artists, to install work in um, a particular garden we were designated, and I was designated this lovely garden called Isaterra, um, which to me was an idyllic setting. The owners were lovely, the um, animals, the creatures that all kind of roamed around freely. Um, it, it seemed to kind of give it this very utopian feeling. So um, lichen, which grows, you know, lichen grows in places where there isn't any pollution. And so it's an indicator of, um, you know, pure air. And I thought, um, because they had lichen growing beautiful, this beautiful orange cupped lichen growing on their trees, I thought that would be a good um, kind of metaphor for, for a utopian place. And it was almost like nature was taking over. So I created this massive installation about seven metres wide um, of scrap, loads of scrap, um, copper, steel, all sorts of things. But then some of these forms were really take took me ages to weave so it was weaving kind of wire and weaving plastic netting and all sorts of other things chicken wire together and creating these these forms and when the rain fell on them they because there's some metal parts there that the, it, the rain sort of tinkled so they made a bit of a sound it was quite nice next please and that was the same piece but reduced and re um kind of repurposed or re-transport, re-installed -in, in, in an indoor setting at Sidcot Art Centre. Um, but I've since, you, you know, create, we kind of, we shaped it, reformed it um, in different settings. So it's always slightly site responsive, but um, I quite like the idea that my work can be repurposed and reused. I've done that more and more. And you can see there's parts, uh, parts of it have got lead, parts of it are copper, nitrate, steel, copper piping, um, but also, you know, um, plastic and um, other profound things. Next, please. Okay, so this is a project I curated in 2015 um, called Step in Stone. And um, it took um, about a year to kind of formulate um, and it was basically a project that was um, installed in in quarry so I I, um, I invited there were 14 artists in total um, and we um, created these artscapes in three quarries and three indoor um, spaces um, in the southwest in the Mendips um, and uh, we had, I got Arts Council funding along with other funding. We did crowdfunding and all that sort of thing. Um, so it was great, um, very hard work, but it was it was great. We all worked as a team. And um, this is one of my pieces in the, a quarry called West Down Quarry. Um, and it was linked to the ancient sea creatures that you find in the limestone in the seabeds there, um, which, so that, so that you know, the, the, the sort of cliff, faces are were the seabed um and um you know you get all these wonderful fossils in them and some of them are crinoids which were um they date back about 350 million years ago hope i've got my facts right um mm -hmm. and crinoids are like they're, they're sort of more um common name is sea lily and they are a creature not a plant um, and they crawl they pull themselves along by their tentacles um, and I just find found them fascinating. I was also quite interested in creating a sort of surreal um, 
strange kind of um, setting. So the one at the back was, um, well, it was a, it was just a version of a crinoid. It wasn't what one of a crinoid necessarily looks like, but the one in the front was more so. Anyway, they were all, they, they were made from found um, objects, a lot of which I found in the quarries because there's all sorts of stuff, junk, um, you know, trash there. And um, you can see it's all sort of woven um, tentacles was something I was interested in. And um, I, I called it Siri, which is C-I-R-R-I, because that means hairy or follicle, uh, you know, follicles, but sort of, yeah, hairs, which is um, a lot of natural forms um, throughout nature um, have have that as their sort of sensory kind of, it's, you know, they use it for sensing where they're, what they're doing what they, and they use it for eating. And um, I, I'm interested in the fact that from micro to macro, you get these forms that are quite similar. Mm -hmm. So next, please. Um, that's also in the quarries. This was in Fairy Cave Quarry, which was just, it's an amazing quarry um, that we, we had permission to install there. And this was to do with the, um, the, the, the fact that the, because of the quarrying, some, um, some caves had been destroyed and this was, created on a site where this cave once was with all these amazing stalactites and stalagmites. Um, so I kind of recreated a sort of remnant cave almost, but using a load of scrap found, again, all found, it mainly found in the quarry, but also using chicken wire, paper, wax. Um, so yeah, it was quite big. Next, please. Then I... Um, I was comm commissioned to create a, um, a canopy for Chelsea Flower Show for Sarah Eberly's um, garden, which won gold and also um, best um, uh, artisan garden. Um, and I did this with Nick Weaver, actually. He made the boat and I made the canopy um, and I created it. Uh, it took me about three months to, to weave and it was very sort of fine weaving. I, I actually made the netting myself um, with really, really fine copper wire. And then through that, we wove um, all these bits of plastic netting. It was linked to the fishing industry in, in um, the Mekong region. Um, so that was the theme. And I also incorporated found things like fish skeletons and um, feathers and all sorts of other found objects, which you probably, what you wouldn't see in this picture, but um, it was quite intricate. Next, please. And then um, in 2017, I decided I needed to challenge my practice. Um, so I I went and did, I did an MA at um, Bath Bar Uni, um, and I it was a two year part time, and I'm so pleased I did it. Um, so my practice since then has had quite a big shift it, but my interest is still um i am you even more using recycled and found materials but um i think when i first started on this ma i was in investigating um the sort of concept of blurring drawing and sculpture so this piece called traces um still along the lines of of uh this is based on whelk fish eggs um but a, a kind of quite large piece which I used the same way that I made that canopy so I used this background of um woven a woven fine woven structure and then into that I wove um more 3d sort of forms and then papered those with um this amazing um thing called cardi paper which is handmade paper and then uh, oiled it so it was a very long process um but it uh yeah it sort of it was it started me exploring different different ways of, of approaching materials and different ways of approaching drawing into sculpture and how how to blur the boundaries um and the next thing you're going to see is um quite a big jump so next please okay i'll just find your video um fiona okay uh... So I'll just talk while you're doing that. Okay. Yep. Please do. <laughs> uh, okay. So um, I I went. Um, okay. 
Hang on yeah. a second. Sorry, well I'm getting there. Get rid of the other one. Brilliant. Let me start that from the beginning for you. Cool. Thank you. Okay, so this is... And I use line as a kind of metaphor for energy. Um, anyway, so at, uh, when was this? This was second year. This was um, in 2018. Um, I um, was selected to go and do this um, kind of workshop stroke exhibition in Italy, in Palermo, as part of Manifesta, uh, with a group of other people. So there was um, there were artists and architects and students all working together. Um, and we and had 10 days, basically, to um, come up with um, work that we either did sort of on our own or collaboratively, um, and then had an exhibition of that work. So it was quite challenging, very interesting. Um, and I, because of my interest in, um, you know, recycling and, and waste and that sort of thing, which was growing um, increasingly at that point, um, I decided to engage the public um, in this area called Danasini, where we were based. And I got this funny little trolley uh well i i, I actually it was I, it was kind of a found object really but i had i paid someone <laughs> i paid someone 10 euros or whatever it was um to, for, to let me have it um and then i found all these bits of string and then this this um bottle cap carrier and i went around because there was so much rubbish in that area um they they just dumped all their stuff on the side of the road and actually people then could go and sort of rifle through the rubbish and there might be a bed there upturned or there might, and there were loads of plastic bottles everywhere, empty plastic bottles. So I went around collecting plastic bottles and the whole point about this project was, it was um, about, the, we were investigating the Kanat system, which is um, these underwater aqueducts. And so my work had to link with water and in Danasini, they have these, this, um, they have a, um, an aqueduct up there so I went and used I took all these bottles and I filled them up at this um little canat at the source um with this you know pure well it wasn't pure water because apparently dogs go in there and who in there but um, <laughs> it it comes from a pure source anyway from the mountains it was a gesture basically it was a gestural performative piece um called gift of water 
and um, the, the girl with me on my on on the left is um, is one of the Italian architectural students who came with me and and translated for me. So I would go up to um, residents in Danazini and um, ask them if they would like some water as a as a gesture of uh, and you know that explained where the water comes from, etc. Um, and it was to water their plants because the manifesto theme that year was um, planetary garden which was all about looking after our world and um, you know tending to it so it kind of had this sort of sort of symbolic um, point to it anyway so I, I it was a, it, this is just a still from the film because um, I wouldn't bore you with the film it's quite a kind of monotonous film of me just traipsing around collecting bottles filling them up and then going around to all the residents but it was it's quite funny as well um, anyway so that was, yes, yeah, so sounds that's, great. <laughs> okay, so this is the, my um, work, uh, my final show at the MA. Um, and I, at that point, had become very um, uh, emotionally involved with everything that's going on. Um, you know, I think probably... Towards the at the beginning of that year, um, a whole load of stuff was sort of coming out. Uh, you know, plastic oceans. Um, I was seeing all these images of, um, you know, albatross chicks with plastic bloated stomachs dying, and uh, just I was getting quite um, upset about the world, really. Um, also, my dog died at the same time, um, or our dog, sorry, Tilly. Um, so it was quite an unhappy time. And also um, I was working, at, uh, um, I work at House and Worth uh, as an invigilator sometimes. And um, I was invigilating a show called The Land We Live, Live in, The Land We Left Behind. And there was a film in there um, by Nicholas Gerholter called Our Daily Bread um, showing. And um, it was in a very dark room. And this film has is a very cold, hard look at um, factory farming. Um, and of course, I knew about factory farming, but that film was a very, very sort of strong statement, which just really, really got to me, <laughs> really, really did. Um, so I I became a vegetarian. I started making all this work um, sort of linked to factory farming, you know, our plastic oceans, the um a sort of increasingly just terrible way us humans are imposing ourselves on nature um, and that's really kind of where I'm where I'm going now but that but that show um, a, lot, a lot of the content was about that really okay next so this is the same piece called glut that you had seen on that other picture um, but I'm going to talk a little bit more about this one because um, this piece has um, done me proud, actually done me well. Um, it's it's been around now, um, and the the point of it is, I started making it um, and not knowing what I was going to make. Basically, I started just wrapping and weaving and um, um, and making these sort of long pieces that became like entrails, um, and using all sorts of things partly um old things of my old um objects that my that came from my dog's possession so because I said that she died so there were her parts of her blankie that I ripped up and used and um some of her old toys and some of my son's old toys that he didn't want anymore because he's now grown up so it's sort of about loss and about um all those things I've just been talking about um and it but it also has a sense of renewal about it because as I said I was interested in Siri and tentacles and uh, the way well you know life renews itself all the time so you, we may we may have all this terrible stuff going on but you know there is that there is a sense of hope in it um, but they are essentially entrails. Next And this is called accretion. Um, so it's it's an it's supposed to be an abject object. So it's not not a, it's supposed to be a very, it's not supposed to be beautiful. It's supposed to make you feel a little bit uncomfortable. A bit like pulling um 
uh, sort of hair out of a plug hole. Um, and it's a metaphor for waste. So it's, it's um, you know, got a load of, it's it layered with all sorts of found stuff like hair and gunk and, um, but also, you know, um, parts of an old r- rug that's coming apart, but don't, I don't, didn't, I didn't want to waste the, the parts of wool that come from it. And, um, you know, it's got bits of copper and it's all woven together. And then it's got a layer of um, cardi paper over it, um, which I mentioned in that other piece mm-hmm. called Traces. And then it's oiled, so it's quite glisteny and quite hairy. Next. And then last year, this is 2020 now, um, I um, had a, I, I w- had a residency at the cells, in these Victorian cells at Tro- Trowbridge Town Hall Arts. And um, the work is site-specific, or site site responsive site site specific i suppose in a way um although i have i have moved this work since but this is a tongue a great big tongue um (laughs) and yeah it's the size of a human or bigger lying down um and i wanted it to be disgusting um but uh, to me the tongue i had thought about it for quite a long time actually before i started making it um i Going back to my dog, when she um, was stuck in kennels, uh, she was very unhappy and she used to sort of lick the bars and lick the bars. And I just remember that tongue, that very fragile, unhappy tongue kind of wanting to get out. Um, So that was in my head. But also, um, you know, when animals are slaughtered, you you often see the tongue like lolling out. It's it's sort of the, the fragile part that's just, you know, I don't know, it's sort of gone limp um and uh, you know because this is the victorian cells i wanted it to link with incarceration and torture um so not just about animals but about loss of freedom you know and often people's tongues are cut out when they can't when they're not you know to, to prevent them from speaking out um truths so, um, yeah, and it's made of um, a whole layer. It's got a lot of layers. It's steel structure, chicken wire, and then all sorts of um, material that I collect, um, particularly that there's a, a towel on the t- on the tip, which I thought worked really well because it's almost that it's got that sort of texture of a tongue to it. And then I wax, put wax on it. But the, this end of it that you can, I can't see all of it, um, was sort of just all kind of almost as though it sort of ripped out so it was it was material and duvets and all sorts of things that that didn't that weren't all sewn and they they kind of came tumbling out next um and this is also part of that project so i basically had a residency in the cells they allowed me to do pretty much what i wanted in there so it was just amazing um it took me back to that um that piece called matter and flux on my ma where i could just go a bit crazy just sort of make what I wanted to make and see what happens so it's quite it was quite a nice way of just experimenting and um so I made these series of ladders with um with the help of Nick Weaver who um helped me a lot technically um and they were all found wood you can't really see the ladders very much in that picture but um they were I made a series of ladders that were rickety ladders and that was all kind of related to a book I had read called Planet of Slums which was um all about it is all about um the kind of precariousness of 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 many people's lives basically and um well we're in precarious times now aren't we so i think um rickety ladders is quite a good sort of metaphor for that next please um okay so shortly after the cells residency i um, or in between, in, during that really, um, I was um, in the process of co-curating um, B Wing, which is a project um, in Shepton Mallet Prison. So I co-curated it with um, uh, Luminara Star, and we um, invited eight um, artist writers to um, install um, poetry, visual art, um, all, t- all together, multidisciplinary in Shepton Mallet Prison, which is decommissioned now. Um, so it's an empty prison, um, very mouldy, um, but amazing um, atmosphere, very, you know, obviously got a really sort of horrible um, history to it. So there was all of that to to kind of um, tackle. 
Um, but I, I continued on this theme of the, the sort of ladders and this was the kind of, I, I installed several ladders actually. Um, so some of the ones I'd already made, but also made these two gigantic ones that were seven meters. And this was suspended, um, from the, the sort of, you can see the top level. Um, and it was suggestive of, um, well, all sorts really dreams, flight, hope. Um, kind of linked to, um, you know, spiritual ascension and the fact that us humans, are, that sort of endless cycle of human human kind of suffering and, and <laughs> evil, really. Um, yeah, but there was an element of hope in that. So th that particular ladder was supposed to look a little bit bone-like and a little bit like a sort of a, almost feathery, like flight flying off. Um, obviously not practical ladder, you wouldn't be able to climb on it, but, um, also kind of a bit like a, a, a kind of skeletal dinosaur hanging in a museum, that sort of feeling. Mm -hmm. Okay. Next please. Oh, and that's another one of the, the ladders. So that, so they, they spanned three floors of the prison. Um, and I called it snakes and ladders. Um, which I thought was um, apt. Um, it's an old children's game, as we all know, um, but it's sort of about that endless cycle. Oh, I, and I was inspired by Piranesi, um, who um, who made this series of, of um, etchings called the Imaginary Prison Series. And I was particularly inspired by one of his etchings called The Bridge, where um, these um, almost Escher-like kind of... Um, bridges um that some of them look like ladders um kind of go don't quite make sense um and actually Escher was inspired by Piranesi anyway so was I mm -hmm. next and there's glut hanging in the prison um which possibly is its best site so far for it um I thought it kind of worked really well there um and you know the the whole the whole theme of, of incarceration um, worked nicely with with my um, you know the concept around glut. Next, this tongue again, um, but you can now see it full length. Um, it was again, it's on a rickety structure, purposefully sort of unstable. So that's a welded kind of um, bar-like structure that I created. Um, and um, it sort of looks like it's about to fall over. Mm -hmm. Luckily, it didn't. And you can see all the sort of duvets and mishmash of other things coming out of it on the other side. Next. Okay, so back to community. Um, I, um, as part of Stepping, sorry, no, we're not Stepping Stone, we're uh, B Wing. As part of B Wing, um, there were a lot of, there's a lot of community engagement with it. We, we were, it was Arts Council funded again. Um, and um, so I ran these collaborative workshops with um, two adult groups at the um, Art Bank in Shepton Mallet, the Rubbish Art Project, um, and invited um, uh, adults to come and join in making these kind of bodily forms that were all about being uh, all about sort of being bound and wrapped so it was all linked to the, the theme of, of the prison um but people kind of took it took their you know um interpreted it in their own way and we and I took a load of material along um all sorts of found stuff and people were also invited to bring something that that was unwanted so a, a, an object at home or more than one um possession that they uh, valued but no long, longer wanted and we um, kind of turned those into um, pieces that then became part of our show, part of the B-Wing show. So the next slide you'll see is is that, that those pieces installed by the adults and myself in the um, prison. There we go, in the cell, in the mouldy, one of the mouldy cells. Um, so that's kind of an installation of um, you know, a public collaborative project, which was nice. We did, and we did it with children. So um, Luminar and I, Luminar and I um, talked, uh, ran workshops with um, 
with young people as well. And their work was also in another cell um, <clears throat> along similar lines, but much smaller little pieces of wrapped, wrapped um, things. Mm -hmm. Next, please. Okay, so this is this year, um, Path of Pollination. I, I installed that at the Black Swan Arts as part of 50 Bees, um, run, which is a project uh, Lydia Needle um, has instigated. And um, artists were asked to um, interpret their um, take on um, a, a bee that they were designated. It's all about um, saving the bees. Um, and my take on it was I, I got really stuck. I got really sort of hooked on um, on pollen, on the, on the stuff of pollen, the actual matter of it, you know, the, what it's made of, um, the sticky stuff that, uh, you, you know, obviously sort of scatters from the hairy bee um, into the stamen. And, um, you know, it, I, I was just in just engrossed in in pollen itself so this piece was was to do with that um and they all those little yellow things are, are yellow sponges just like found old washing up sponges that um i cut into shapes and sewed and wrapped and then waxed and um added a bit of mustard powder here and a bit of you know this and that um so uh, and there was another part to it as well but this was just that was just one part okay. next please so your final image, um, uh, Fiona, is a movie. So if you just give me a moment to load that up. Great. Thanks. A little slideshow. A slideshow. OK, so we're now present in the present. Um, and this is called Pyre. Um, and I created this for an exhibition, which is an, a ghost exhibition, just because of, um, you know, dare I say it, um, COVID-19. We um, couldn't have the exhibition open to the public. But what we did was we installed it and we've been showing our work online. Um, so what it is, is um, this it, it, incendiary um, is the name of the exhibition and it's about um, well my take on it was the wildfires um, but um, it, it was it's really just about um, combustion and you know the, the, the sort of the state of our world again um, but I was horrified of course like everybody else with with the wildfires um not just the australian one but the amazon one um and um you know it's all linked to climate breakdown and i just could not believe the extent of it um really got to me um i decided to collect um, a load of objects um, or use loads of objects that I already had collected um, and char them. I wrapped them as little bundles, grief bundles, and charred each each bundle and then put it together uh, like a sort of, like a pyre really, you know, a sort of um, burnt pile. Um, but it was about, it's about the detail really, not just, not this, the pile, it's about what what went into it and the, all the wrapping and the time that's and that's it really my so my work is is sort of about the labor intensiveness um so the labor the, the kind of the, the process um that i go through in making is is part of the message mm. so there we go okay all right then all right Hello, we're, you're back on the screen, Fiona. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, we've had some really interesting questions coming through, actually, from uh, people watching. Um, when we're at the engine room, um, uh, we would normally... I'll just put myself back on so everybody can see me. Put myself there. <laughs> when we're at the engine room, we would normally um, give the artist who's made a presentation a big round of applause. So I'm going to do that here, and I would like you to all do that at home as well, please. <laughs> I can hear it. It's really loud. It's great, Yay! isn't it? <laughs> um, so uh, one question that's come from the uh, one of the listeners, and viewers rather, uh, is Fiona planning to make more any more work on the subject of climate change? 
Oh, yes, but I'm not quite sure where what I'm. Go- I mean, I'm I'm just making um, these sort of sewn pieces still, glut uh, like pieces. Um, so I'm I'm still on that trajectory. Um, but yes, definitely, I'm going to keep making stuff about that. Um, not quite sure exactly what I'll make next and I might carry on with the glut and the pyre theme for a bit longer because I think the pyre needed to be bigger mm. uh, I hadn't had quite enough time to make a bigger pile um, so I thought I could keep going with that for a bit while I'm my brain keeps you know moving <laughs> <laughs> um, another question that's kind of an interesting one uh, does Fiona identify her work with feminism at all or is her work focus mainly, mainly environmentalism? Um, I guess more environmentalism, but um, increasingly I'm wanting... Um, I mean, I identify with female artists more than male artists. I think that just goes without, I think that just happens naturally. Um, you know, people like Eva Hess, Louise Bourgeois, etc. cetera. Um, but I guess I couldn't, no, I can't say I'm a fem- feminist artist because it's not the, the main thrust of my work. Mm. But, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a strident female artist so uh in that respect you know there's there's that sort of feminist angle to it Mm -hmm. um we've got a question here uh can fiona talk at all about her process of exploring the ideas perhaps before the final pieces are being made um i usually um have quite a long period of, of just writing and sketching in my sketchbook. So um, I will have, you know, make notes, think, um, collect objects. Sometimes an object will spark off something. Sometimes it, my idea will come from lots of research. If it's site responsive, I'll have um, done a lot of maybe online research and reading before I kind of make any decisions Mm. Um, but there it's a combination of sketching thinking writing drawing uh uh, have i said that drawing sketching um maybe even just a sort of splurgy collage that just kind of tries to get my loosen up my ideas sometimes that that sparked off Mm. work Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's fantastic. And there's a really great little comment that's just come in. And I've got a couple of questions I'd like to ask. Um, I visited, the, an artist has just uh, commented, I visited and really enjoyed both Stepping Stone and B-Wing and deeply impressed by all the work to make those projects happen, getting those venues, publicity, etc. To me seems a major strength in your practice and wonder how important leading and curating projects is to you and whether you will do more of that. Thank you very much, by the way. Um, thank you, Sulo. <laughs> well, thank you, Sue. Um, yeah, I do see myself as a curator as well as an educator. So artist, educator and curator. And um, I do enjoy curating but it does take up all my energy when I when it you know when the project's ongoing Mm. and I the only thing I'd say about it is that if I'm featuring in the work in the project which I'd like to usually um as well as curate that takes away from my my own work a bit and it's sometimes um you know I've possibly sacrificed when you you know the previous question was about research uh, or my process rather in in coming to ideas if i just had my own work to think about rather than a whole project as well um possibly the work ideas might be stronger so 
I guess what I'd really like to do is um, just work in, in this solitary way that we're now put up, that we've now been placed um, on a kind of body of work for something like a solo and maybe not to curate for a bit. But I wouldn't say no, I wouldn't. I definitely would like to curate in the future. I think it's, um, I like working with other artists and um, collaborations always um, spark up off sort of interesting um, ideas and ways of, uh, you know, different approaches. Um, and I, I always get quite excited when I'm on one of those projects. So, yeah. We've had another question uh, from Jody, which is short and to the point. Um, given the extent to which you ponder the horrors of reality, how do you maintain a healthy mental state? God. <laughs> um, I, I, I often feel very upset about everything, but... Um, I try to, <laughs> I don't know, that's that's where my art comes in. That's why I do art. I mean, it's it's my way of dealing with it. In fact, that piece, Glut, I was literally it was, uh, rapping to heal. You know, it was, it was sort of, as I wrapped and sewed, and it was a sort of form of suturing, you know, like a kind of mending repair. Um, process and I think that's how I deal with it um, I don't get really depressed um, and I think I'm quite an optimistic person so I guess um, everything I do is is in the hope that things will get better you know that we'll yeah. improve our ways <laughs> somehow well, you used that phrase earlier, uh, your work's a metaphor for waste. Um, but it's, I guess it's a metaphor for lots of things, isn't it, really? Um, mm. your, the production of your work is, is that a cathartic thing, is it? Going back yeah. to Jodie's, you know, yeah. But the more recent, yeah, the, the more recent work definitely is. Mm. I've got some very noisy collared doves. It's <laughs> fine, they sound great. Um, so... Uh, you describe your work as a form of artivism, mm. which is a phrase I've not heard before. So just tell, tell me what that means. OK. Um, so art and activism, it, it's a fusion of, of art and activism. So it's um, basically those two words together. Um, I'm not sure where I came across the term, but I really, I like it. Um, I think it's just like we were just saying um it's a way of of tackling um political environmental you know all those sorts of um issues um not trying to solve anything because that's not necessarily going to happen through art but it's a it's a way of maybe raising awareness um so it's a kind, it is a sort of form of activism. Um, I've got a quote here, Oliver Ellison, um, who created Ice Watch in 2018. Mm -hmm. He said, in order to create the massive behavioural change needed, we have to emotionalise that data. Um, so I think that um, if you make art that people can identify with emotionally, maybe, um, you know, you're, you're, you're helping a bit. To, to, because... Facts and scientific facts. I mean, I, you know, maybe this coronavirus will do huge amount of good to us all. Mm. Um, but I, I think until it sort of hits you here, um, often it's quite hard to accept. So that's why there's so much denial in the world. And I think if we are, if we, you, I feel that if I, my art sort of has an emotional angle to it. It might have some good, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so your work um, blurs the boundaries between sculpture, drawing, installation art. So do you see yourself as uh, you're not going to pigeon yourself, pigeonhole yourself into being a particular artist with a particular kind of practice? You're, you, you know, you blur the boundaries, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
because I I think I'm more of a drawer, a draw I don't want to put it say draftsman or draftswoman. Um but I I draw in space. So um it doesn't I'm not um I wouldn't necessarily say I'm a sculptor. Um mm. Yeah, I like the idea of working in the expanded field where there's there's a sort of there's a there's kind of no edge between each one and they they mingle because I think actually more and more now um, art's becoming more interdisciplinary anyway and there's that sort of flux between different pra- pra- different disciplines um, and it's much more interesting. I don't really see why there has to be those sort of separate categories. I know we like to categorise, so yeah. Uh, it's easier sometimes if I just say I'm a sculptor. Uh, so, yeah. Where was the beat then? What was it? Uh, I just had an email. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, you uh, you mentioned that everything in life is, in essence, biological, um, which is a quote um, from Le Corbusier. You mentioned that on your website. So um, what do you, what's your understanding of that statement and how, how do you align yourself with that statement? I see that to mean that um, everything, everything, all matter um, is from nature, you know, originates in nature. Mm. Um, and I know that man intervenes um, through all sorts of chemical processes to change some of them um you know for industry etc so that's where we get plastic but you know if you think of limestone for example that makes uh, that paves the streets in london that comes from diatoms that are crushed um you know over you know millions of years so um my point is that i i use industrial and organic materials, um, or what we call organic and industrial, um, but my but but in order to be sustainable, I I tend to try I try to use found and recycled. So even though I might use I may, I use most materials basically, but try not to use anything that's toxic or um, I try not to go buy stuff in the shops actually (laughs) mainly financially but also i just think there's so much stuff around that we can use um and yeah i enjoy the idea of finding so it was more about that the fact that um i don't see that there's a distinction although if you if you just pick up something a, a stick um and that becomes your artwork. That that is clearly more natural than something you know made of resin or something. But um, but there's lots of grey areas in between, aren't there? Yeah. Okay. Um, so we'll we'll wrap it up in a minute, Fiona. Um, okay. I'll just ask you one more question. I think. Um, so uh, your you work. Uh, Part of your practice is about community engagement, um, the wire workshops and so on that you, you run. Um, so would you describe yourself as a socially engaged artist and what does socially engaged mean to you? Um, I, I talked for a while, for, for several years. So I think that's where it all came from for me to, to, to want to um, share my my practice with other people um, and so I, I'm quite interested in creating projects that um, open up art to people that wouldn't non-art you know non-art people people who wouldn't normally um, go to those venues for example like the prison um, that was uh, it, it attracted a different audience just because of the site um, so in terms of socially engaged, I mean, I, I work, you know, I, I lead workshops and do community work uh, a lot because I'm interested in um, sharing the message, sharing my skills. Um, that's that's what I think is socially engaged in, in terms of my practice. I mean, there's obviously lots of different um, ways. Yeah. So that's, yeah. 
Brilliant. Thank <laughs> you so much, uh, Fiona. Um, I'm sure everybody uh, is uh, found that really interesting. And um, normally at the Creative Network at this stage, we'd go into the wonderful Engine Room Cafe and have a nice, wonderful cup of tea. Uh, but you're going to have to do that in your own kitchens, I'm afraid. So uh, thanks, Fiona. Uh, if you'd all like to go and make yourself a cup of tea now, um, and I'm guessing we'll be uh, running a similar kind of um, creative network next month. We'll have to wait and see. <clears throat> so uh, watch this space. But I think, um, you know, just to say that if uh, you're an artist, you've been watching this and uh, you'd like to, um, you know, uh, have a focus on your work at the creative network, then um, just... Um, send me a comment or contact me at richard at somersetfilm.com. Um, and I think, you know, you allude, alluding to this in your presentation, um, Fiona, that uh, we are living through a stressful, anxious time. Um, but you, you, we, will, we would hope that every cloud has a silver lining. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, just the very fact that we're finding new ways of sharing ideas and um, communicating ideas and, you know, uh, having discussions with artists just using social uh, social media um, is, is a real step forward in and of itself. So, um, you know, uh, whatever happens over the coming months, um, we're, uh, we at Somerset Film are likely to be using these kind of platforms much, much more anyway. Um, OK, thank you, Fiona. Um, you can sign off now, I think, if you want to. Uh, thank you. Bye. Um, yeah. So if you want to know more about Somerset Film, uh, go to somersetfilm.com. Uh, the um, site at the moment is being um, changed a little bit. Um, and we're updating things to, to reflect what's going on at the moment. Um, so, um, oh, there's lots and lots of me for you to look at. So. Everything is going very glitchy here. So thanks for watching and um, I'll see you next month. Goodbye. <laughs>